and hopefully everybody sees me. I'm sitting over here behind the library reference desk. I'll just do a quick introduction, Val. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, may I just introduce Dr. Valerie Hill, known here in Second Life as Val Librarian. Um, and we are in the community virtual library. Val does a really interesting talk um, every semester for this group uh, about meta literacy, which you might need to have uh, explained to you as a term, and also um, about digital citizenship. And these are this talk is based on her recent publication, a really interesting book on meta literacy and digital literacies. So without further ado, may I hand over to Val Librarian. Thank you, Val. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, John. Well, welcome, everyone. And I'll get my speakeasy ready here. I'll be using both voice and local chat. So as John said, I'm Dr. Valerie Hill. I've been researching virtual environments for 15 years with a focus on changing literacy. As the information revolution turned literacy and life upside down. So I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library here in Second Life. And this is a real library in a virtual world, overseen by real librarians and information professionals in the physical world. So here we are at our Community Virtual Library, CDO, reference desk, where real librarians can serve virtual world communities. Many of the objects around here, such as books or this old catalog, card catalog box at the desk, uh, many of the signs are, are interactive. So click on things. As we're looking around, you'll notice an interactive calendar by the back door with calendar links to all the various virtual world communities. You'll also find the times that librarians are on duty and many of the projects and the resources that, that we have are found on our website, which is communityvirtuallibrary.org. I'm going to stand up. And behind the desk over this way are many of the tools that the librarians use. We collect statistics so we know what kinds of information virtual world digital citizens need. I'm going to ask all of you to turn around and follow me and walk into our main reading room this direction. I wasn't sure how many to expect, so but try to find a seat or you can wander over by the book stacks. I'm going to stand over here by the books. And if everyone would walk in, find a seat, gather around, and then I'd like to ask you to use your camera today to look around and zoom in on things. Look at all the different avatars that are gathering here and each one of us is a real person behind that avatar. Now this, um, this room is just a tip of the hat to the traditional resources of the past. Certainly we would not need to have a virtual book to click on to open up and read when you can go to a physical library and get a book or a bookstore or you can find many of these online if they're um, at Project Gutenberg. But I think uh, this tip of the hat shows a balance between tradition, the beautiful libraries of the past, and innovation where we can have Libraries interact in any kind of way, in any kind of imaginative setting. A little about myself, so you'll know who I am. I was a school librarian. I taught at all grade levels, first grade, fifth grade, and then as a school librarian for 20 years and a college professor of information science. During a time when libraries were completely revolutionized by digital culture, I mentioned that, of course, in Second Life, we could have created a library on another planet or a fantasy world or a completely different place using our imaginations. Anything here is possible. But the pur purpose of this building was for us to think about our heritage of information, the heritage, the rich heritage of libraries 
and then balance that with the innovative possibilities of the future. And you can even think about virtual reality with headsets as well as desktops as we go through this demonstration of what a library in the future may become. I want you to contemplate the question, do you think that libraries and literacy have changed? As you're using your camera looking around this library, which is a real library, think about how libraries have changed. Think about how this is different. And if, you, if something comes to mind, please type in the local chat how this is similar or different than a physical world library. I certainly like to say that the library is now in our pockets. For me, the turning point was when I got my first smartphone connected to the internet, and it, I realized the library is in my pocket. You can check out a book from the library, you can Google anything, yes, wisdom seeker, but I do like to say the internet may be the greatest library in the world, but all the books are on the floor. And that's a that's a, a quote that I often uh, like to talk about because it's true. It's very hard to organize information on the internet. You get a million hits when you type something in. Sidearm asks, how are digital libraries the same or different from real world libraries? So think about that. They're different and yet they're the same. And Okan says they're more convenient. Okay, you don't have to go anywhere. Distance is completely irrelevant in a virtual world because it's just a teleport away. Now, as we go through this virtual world library demonstration, you may see some other similarities and differences between a virtual world library and a physical world library, or simply the internet. Because the internet, people think they're doing research often on the internet, but we live in a post-truth world. More on that later. It's very difficult to find true information online. I want to ask the question, though, can you access most information on your digital device? Most people do carry a, a digital device with them. And think about can, how easy is it to access that information there. As a digital citizen, that's a really important question. Changing literacy impacts us all, each one of you. Now, if you're older, some of you may remember life before the internet. A lot of you were born in digital culture, and the internet has always been a part of your life. Can you type in the te text chat if the, if the internet has always been a part of your life um, and you were born in digital culture? Type that in the text chat so I can get an age bracket. I was born way before the internet, and I can remember how it completely revolutionized my library. I even typed on physical card catalogs in my early days as a librarian, and now the young students who come in have never seen a physical card catalog. Yes, so those of us that were born before the internet understand this revolutionary change, but those born during, after all of this change, You've always been a digital citizen, but I hope to challenge you today to think about what that means. Yeah, sen de I was born before internet diyorsun ya. Sanki right. bana 30 yaşında. Okay. So that's my focus today is digital citizenship and as a librarian and you're going to learn some new terms about that today. My passion as well as my research topic. So I'm going to ask you all now to stand up, and we're going to walk around a bit. We are going to walk outside in front of the library and stand on the stars. Right out front of the library, there are a lot of stars out there on the, uh, the patio. So come stand on these stars, and we'll continue there. Don't walk past them, please. If you walk past the stars, you may lose voice because we're going to cross a parcel. So please stand right near or on these stars. Look down with your camera and you'll see these stars. They are a tribute to the librarians over the past 15 years 
who worked to help create and build this virtual world library. When you click on each star, it will give you a note card about that particular librarian. In fact, we have a memorial around back for those who have passed away. So this library has been going on for, for 15 years. Now look across with your camera, across the courtyard, and you're going to see a red arrow. In a few minutes, we're going to, in just a moment, we're going to walk over there. But I don't want you to go yet because you may lose voice, and I'll walk over there and meet you. Uh, if you know how to cam out, you can cam out um, with your mouse and look at this beautiful building. Our builder created a Mediterranean-style library, and you can see the beach behind us. Um, it's amazing how, how beautiful some of the things are that can be created in Second Life, the various styles of architecture. Um, our our uh, builder is Dawn Graymist, and she is a library director at a university in Hawaii. So I'm going to walk across and stand by the red arrow, and I won't speak again until I, you all gather there. So walk over and stand right by the bookmobiles or the red arrow. Parcel. You'll see a uh, great Urjo sitting up on top of the bookmobile. Excellent. Those bookmobiles are filled with resources about the Community Virtual Library, resources that we give out to various communities of learning. There are so many different ways to learn in a virtual world science, art, history. You name it. I love historical, immersive learning environments where you can go into the past. So we support all the learning communities in Second Life. All right, looks like everyone has gathered over by the red arrow. And I asked you to look over. You can kind of use your camera and look over at the building from here, too. We're going to walk up this ramp and gather up on at the top of the ramp. And I'm going to uh, share a presentation here. And you can use your camera to follow me as I sit up here on one of my slides. So you can zoom in on the slide where I'm sitting to see where I'm beginning my presentation. Meta literacy for digital citizens. I'm going to be sitting on top of my presentation. And I want to point out that there is now a need for a new look at literacy, meta-literacy. Meta-literacy is a new term for literacy in digital culture because we can all communicate with many digital devices all over the world in real time. I'm going to give you the Turkish definition, and hopefully that is a pretty good translation. Literacy in digital culture requires juggling formats, both physical and digital. And sometimes it's juggling them quickly and simultaneously. We are all now required to become good digital citizens, as most of our communication and information intake is in digital formats. Please type a Y in the text chat if you feel that digital citizenship is important. I'm pretty sure you've all heard of it, but type an N if you're unfamiliar with the term digital citizen, if you haven't turned, heard of it. But I believe most of you here, as digital citizens in a virtual world, already have heard that term. You'll see there is uh, the cover of my book, Metamodernism and Changing Literacy, Emerging Research and Opportunities. I'll talk a little bit um, about that later. Most of the um, information in this presentation comes directly from my book. I'm going to stand up and move over to my next slide. And you'll see here the term prosumer. Alvin Toffler, a well-known futurist, coined this term, prosumer. And this is 
back in the 80s, he saw this coming, which I find really intriguing. He saw that individuals were beginning to create and share content themselves. And, and so you put the two ter- words together, a producer and a consumer, and you get a prosumer. We are prosumers. We are creating what we call user-generated content. Now, the information hierarchy toppled during my career as a librarian. It completely went upside down. From information stemming from traditional publishers to information being created by everyone and uploaded online. So today, we have far more user-generated content than we do content from traditional media formats, such as books published through traditional um, publishing companies, and um, traditional media such as films and movies that are um, given to us through traditional sources. In fact, YouTube has become the number one source of information on the planet. You want to change your um, plumbing in in your bathroom sink? There's a YouTube video for it. Want to learn how to knit or crochet? Go to YouTube. So we are both consumers and producers of media. We're all prosumers. And with all this user-generated content being uploaded every single moment of the day, we are bombarded by information constantly. This is a challenge to literacy. The sheer volume of information that we get every single day coming at us on our digital devices. That illustrates the need to rethink literacy. So I'll ask you to think about that yourself. How many of you upload content online? And I'm going to ask you to think about it and please type the platform where you upload or post the most often. Do you share things on Facebook or YouTube? Do you have a blog? Um, Twitter, Twitch, I know a lot of people are live streaming on Twitch, Discord, TikTok, other apps. Okay, they're coming in. Just type what you use the most often, and maybe you use a lot of them. Discord has really become popular. We use it often when we're exploring different VR environments. We'll use it for our back chat and voice because so many platforms don't have good voice. Instagram, I think it may be more popular popular with young people than face, Facebook. Um, WhatsApp, yes, because it's global. A lot of people, if they're traveling, I know, use WhatsApp because it's so global. Um, and then, of course, YouTube. I had fifth graders in my fifth grade class that had their own YouTube channel where they were uploading Minecraft videos. So, yes, there's so many different user-generated content platforms. Instagram. Um, If you think of another one, feel free to add that to chat as I stand and move over to my next slide. Alvin Toffler, as I mentioned, was a famous uh, futurist, and this quote is often uh, given by, by Alvin Toffler, and I love this quote. He said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Literacy used to be reading and writing. It's not anymore. It's juggling all these tools. And what does it mean to, to learn, unlearn, and relearn? Well, think about the changing formats. Just when you master version 5.6 on your app, Here comes version 5.7. Everything's changed. you got to relearn it. You have to relearn your apps, your operating system. All of the programs that you use are constantly getting upgraded, ironing out the bugs. So literacy means constant change now. And that is not the way, those of us before the internet, internet, not the way that we learned. Our apps, our operating systems, constantly changing. Some elderly people that I work with, they find this constant change a huge challenge. Some of you may have grandparents that that ask for your help on their digital devices because older people learned in a more linear way. 
And this constant oscillation, this, this swinging between production and consumption of media, this swinging between the physical world and the virtual, between physical and digital formats, it aligns to our philosophical moment in time, which I call metamodernism. And we're going to talk about that a little more. So think about that term, metamodernism. Metamodernism is the term that many people are using to identify our current philosophical moment. Because postmodernism, it's ended. Just when I finally figured out what it was, it was already over. Some of you may be uh, familiar with postmodernism. Um, maybe some of you are interested in philosophy. I'll, I've always been intrigued by it, even though I'm not um, you know, a philosopher as far as I haven't had a lot of, uh, it's not my major, but I'm fascinated with philosophy. And, and this word metamodernism, I feel, really does match our current times. And I'll give you the Turkish definition for metamodernism. Of course, it's really difficult to name or to fully understand our historical moment when we're in it. History means looking at the past, and we're in it right now, so we can't exactly name the past. Time will tell. But I follow some philosophy students in, uh, in Amsterdam, um, a professor there who wrote the foreword to my book, and I really feel that metamodernism nails it. It's a great term. Some people are calling our current era post-postmodernism, but I think that sounds a bit redundant. Acquiring knowledge in the past meant climbing the ladder toward final mastery? Not anymore. In metamodern culture, we learn new tools and apps while constantly evaluating live information and adapting to new devices and constant software updates. It's a swinging back and forth, and there's no end to the incoming stream of information. I'm going to give a link here to my book, and you can just look, you know, get that later and, and look at it. I'll also give that later, so no need to copyright now. But my book addresses the challenges we face due to this constant change. It's imperative that all of us understand our personal responsibility as digital citizens. And I'm going to stand up and move over to my next slide and give you another word to think about. I've introduced you to a term that, that uh, fits our personal responsibility. And that uh, is at any age, from really young children through the elderly. The term is meta-literacy. Now, I didn't come up with this term. Tom Mackey and Trudy Jacobson, in 2014, first coined the term to help us better understand how we can be literate in digital culture as prosumers. They actually came up with it earlier than that, but that's one of the references that I'll give you here at the end. Meta literacy. It's essential to digital citizenship. You can find more about it at the Meta Literacy blog, metaliteracy.org. I shared a guest blog post there that you can read later as well if you're interested in meta literacy. And you can see on the circle, zoom in on the slide where I'm sitting. You can see there's a lot to meta literacy. I won't go deeply into it today, but you can see that we play many roles, each one of us as a meta-literate individual, as a consumer and a producer of content. The internet connected us all. It gave every single one of us a voice. That is huge. But not everyone has something meaningful to add to the conversation. The internet has become a flood of information that's impossible to navigate without meta-literacy. Once we understand what it means to be prosumers and participants in digital culture, well, unless you're a hermit high up in the mountains and you don't have any internet connection at all, well, we need to become aware of the need for digital citizenship. And we can learn to be an ethical 
contributor and an ethical participant. I'm going to sit over here on the digital citizenship wheel. Now, I said everyone has a voice online, but not everything shared is good or meaningful or true. In fact, Mackie and Jacobson believe that we live in a post-truth world. The many elements of digital citizenship are well beyond the scope of this short talk. We could have many, many presentations and talks on digital citizenship. But they cover the ethical use of information, they cover cybersecurity and safety, all types of communication online, um, our privacy, and even emotional intelligence. If you zoom in on this wheel where I'm sitting and look at all the different colors, um, this comes from the DQ Institute. You will see that um, there's many things that it covers and uh, at all ages. But we're not going to talk about all of them today. I want you to consider this question. And then perhaps you can type in chat if you, if you would like. When I was a school librarian a few years back, I asked the parents at uh, one of the meetings where they all attended, at what age do you think your child becomes a digital citizen? And someone gathered there said probably around 9 or 10. But it is often much younger than that. Very young children are seen on digital devices every day. And many parents upload a sonogram of their unborn child on social media. So perhaps digital citizenship can even begin before birth. Think about the children that you know, brothers, sisters, neighbors, and friends. Do you think they need to know how to be safe online? So if you've been thinking about the children in your life that you know, type what age. Do you know a child that uses online digital apps and games or digital devices? Type the age in the chat of a child you've seen utilizing online digital culture. And I want to see how young some of you you've seen. Uh, look, I'm seeing some ages, seven, six, even three and four, age three and four. There are apps for little toddlers where they can interact on these digital devices. And some of these apps are, are so-called educational apps but they're created by people that have no background in education. So it's, it's really important that we learn how to evaluate some of these tools. And what about teenagers? Have you encountered any oversharing on social media or cyberbullying? You hear about cyberbullying all the time. Or the huge problem of the low self-esteem that can happen, especially with teenage girls, when teens compare their pretty lives through the pictures that they edit and place on Instagram. Well, I often give this resource, commonsensemedia.org is a great resource to share for parents, teachers, anyone interested in learning more about uh, digital citizenship and helping young people. There's a lot of resources there. And I'm sitting by this flag. You can see it's a, uh, it's a stop and think flag. Think before you post. So I want to think about, I talked about the young children needing to be digital citizens and the teenagers. But I want to ask you a couple more questions before we go on. Even the elderly need to know about oversharing and how to use social media. It's a concern for all age groups. And um, the elderly is another age group that has particular digital citizenship concerns because scamming and uh, they can fall you know, victim to phishing scams and privacy issues. So meta literacy concerns all of us, no matter what your age is and no matter your generational group. I'm going to stand and sit on my balancing act. You can zoom in on this slide about literacy requiring a balancing act. In metamodern culture, we have to balance 
I mentioned that I was a school librarian for 20 years and witnessed the close of the Gutenberg parenthesis. That was the 500 period of time that is over when book was king. Book is no longer king of the information hierarchy. Print is no longer king of information. Most things are now born digital. And I'll give you a little link there if you're intrigued by what the Gutenberg parentheses is. That period between about 1500 when Gutenberg created the printing press and invented that miraculous printing press um, until about the year 2000. But now, fixed print media is giving way to fluid digital media. No more printed encyclopedias. I saved a few just to show the kids in the library. They're around, but no one buys them anymore. No more print dictionaries, or very few anyway. How many of you still enjoy reading a book in print? Feel free to type a Y if you do. I don't think they'll ever go away. There are some great advantages to having a book in print. You can take it anywhere. You can even read it in the bathtub. I would never bring my digital device in the bathtub. <laughs> you can, uh, it's yours. It doesn't change like an ebook when the device dies. You don't own that content. Or when, you know, when ebooks, uh, when content um, migrates to a new hardware, you, a book doesn't change. It's, it stays the same. I love books. They'll probably always be around. We have ebooks and websites and databases and videos and podcasts and blogs and apps and on and on and on, juggling all these tools, sometimes simultaneously, is actually challenging the human brain. And this juggling is a meta literacy skill, it's part of digital citizenship. You can just get sucked away by the stream of social media into a self-absorbed whirlpool. Do you ever see people just staring into the, your, their phone and you're thinking, where are they all? As you're on the bus or a train and they're all just staring. You can get sucked into it and more on the dark side of digital culture a bit later, which I, I write about in my book. There is a dark side. Not only must we learn to juggle and to choose the best digital resources, we also juggle between physical worlds. We juggle between physical, virtual, and augmented. Choosing the best space for particular purposes, working, gaming, or social interaction, or learning, all of that is a meta-literacy skill. It's a balancing act, and it's now a personal responsibility. And you know, as these new platforms are emerging constantly with VR reality, uh, virtual reality um, headsets and 360 degree videos becoming mainstream, meta literacy is indeed a balancing act for everybody. And I'll ask right here before I move on, do any of you have a VR headset? Because we'll talk a little bit later about VR headsets. Um, we're in what I call virtual reality on a desktop but it is virtual reality. I'm gonna move over to the next slide. Yes, the information revolution has changed literacy forever. And we live in a fascinating, fast-paced time, no matter what it's called. But I've adopted the term metamodernism for our philosophical moment. I mentioned there are other names in the running like post-postmodernism, post hypermodernism, there are other names, but we'll see what it's, uh, what it's called a few years from now. Now today I'm presenting this topic here in the metaverse, and that's a place where metadata constructs a simulation of reality. Now think about that. We are here, each one of us, a person, and you look around at each other. We are standing inside a metaphor of our world. Think about that. You're, and as you think about that, you're using metacognition. Metacognition means thinking about thinking. Meta, meta, meta. There's a lot of meta going on here. <laughs> I didn't see anybody 
answer that they have a VR headset, but that may come up again later in the topic. I'll move over here to our next slide. So I think we've, we have become metamodern. And it's certainly time to become meta-literate. This slide gives you just a little glimpse of some visuals about metamodernism to help you wrap your brain around what is this metamodern cultural moment all about? Well, metamodernism includes all the ways that we express ourselves in our cultural era, era through art, literature, music, architecture, all the ways we express as human beings. So you zoom in on this slide where I'm sitting. Um, my book looks at our philosophical eras of the past, stressing the importance of learning history and not throwing away our history. Metamodernism swings between past and present and future. And you can see some past art here, Monet and uh, different artists throughout history. Of course, I mentioned you can't name a historical moment when you're in it, but um, we will look, you know, we'll look at this in the future and see if it's the name that will stick. We're all standing here as avatars in this environment. And I see Kimberly sitting up on the learning environment slide. Take a look at the next slide. As you're here learning in this virtual environment, we're all learning using meta literacy as we learn in this environment. And you can see some of the ways people learned in the past. Zoom in on the slide next to me here on that old, old picture of how people learned uh, in traditional rows of desks. Now, that's a modern time there. That's not that's not a meta modern moment. <laughs> Traditional rows of desks, and then look at the other pictures there. Some some people in VR. I went in on a VR headset to alt space VR. That's a picture um, in a virtual environment. And then there's augmented reality. Look at the picture down at the bottom left. Augmented reality, where you can mix reality with the physical world. Now, some of you may be totally comfortable using these digital tools and applications, but it's impossible to use them all. There are so many apps out there and so many different um, tools. It's impossible to keep up with them all, even, even if you stayed up and never got any sleep. <laughs> so um, it's important to match the best tool for the job. So learning environments have changed and they require metal literacy. I'm going to move on over to this one. I won't talk a lot about the preservation of literacy formats, but it's extremely important. Some of you that were born after the internet may not even know what some of these, um, these formats are on the slide, preservation of literacy formats. An important part of our digital metamodern culture and meta literacy is preservation. Now, it's a huge topic, archiving information. But it's not just a topic for librarians and archivists. It's important for you. It's important for each person and part of meta literacy because most content today is born digital and we must learn how to migrate. That means to change to the next format or it could all be lost. Look at that broken cassette tape there. These are VHS tapes and there's old floppy disks. If that breaks and there's not a backup copy, whatever's on that is lost forever. The Dead Sea Scrolls, if you look up there at that picture of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that was a physical format. When they dug them up, they actually could see what was happening thousands and thousands of years ago and they could read it because physical books and physical formats, they are easier to archive than digital formats. So that, that's when you think about that, we have to figure out how to migrate our digital formats or they could be lost forever. I remember going through old albums of my mother's and seeing pictures of her grandparents and great grandparents. A lot of people don't have physical pictures anymore, physical photo albums. Do any of you print out photo, photo albums and create physical albums of pictures? 
Will your great great grandchildren find your photos? Some people are are copying those photos and, and creating books. There's some cool uh, companies that make photo albums for you if you upload your pictures so you have your own personal books. Um, my daughter-in-law does that for my grandson sometimes, makes a picture photo album for him of the family um, so that it's not all, because she has trouble finding those photos. Are you good at organizing your photos? Do you put them in albums? It's time consuming. You can answer that in the local chat. Do you have a physical picture album? Do you organize your photos into some kind of digital photo albums? That's personal archival of digital content. And a lot of people don't. I mean, uh, um, they rely on apps like Google Photos, or some people just put them all on Facebook, and they have, or on their, their um, either some kind of digital device, like on your iPad or your other digital device and just keep them all there. It's important to think about the future because some of these, as, as, as the hardware devices change, where will that content go? In fact, some people even predict the digital dark ages. <laughs> You're going to look it up later. There are problems ahead, but I remain hopeful. So future research is needed on everything that I am researching to understand digital citizenship, to understand how to embrace it and teach it for the next generation. Sidon puts in the text chat, my backup hard drive failed and he lost his, all of his San Diego Zoo pictures. Oh, uh, many of us could have stories about different horrible moments. You know, I, I lost one entire computer. I got the blue screen of death. It was a horrible feeling, uh, especially during the time when I was getting my PhD. I thought I lost my dissertation. Fortunately, I had it in two or three different places, and that's important. There are two terms that I want you to take away today, and we're going to talk about them in a few minutes. Metamodernism, which simply means our current philosophical moment, and meta-literacy, which is simply literacy in digital culture, a term to address, address literacy as prosumers. You can zoom in on the references if you choose. Meta-literacy provides a comprehensive framework to effectively participate in social media, and online communities. And it's a unified construct that supports the acquisition, production, and sharing of knowledge in collaborative online communities. And that is where most learning takes place today and most living takes place today. Now, I mentioned the dark side of digital culture. You all remember that? Well, I'm going to ask you to, stay, to uh, follow me, but first give me a second to put on my flag, which is called Think Before You Post. And I'm putting it on so you don't lose me. You'll be able to follow me because you'll see my flag here as I walk down the ramp. So I'm going to ask you to follow me down the ramp, and we are going to walk a bit to the left across these stones. And I'm going to ask you to walk into the black room on the beach. I created this black room. And go on in, right through the curtain, to represent the dark side of digital culture, which I presented in my book. Walk inside the blackness, through the black tapestry hanging on the front door. And you can sit on a beanbag. You may feel a little uncomfortable in here, and that's intentional. Find a beanbag here. And you can use your camera to find my flag if you lose, lose me. You'll see where I am standing. As I said, you might feel a little cramped or uncomfortable in here, and that is intentional. Because the dark side of digital culture is uncomfortable. 
I want you to look at this sign above me. And I'll stand right over here. You can look at the sign up above me that shows just a few of the concepts in digital culture that might be uncomfortable. And it may be difficult for you to cam up to see the slide, the dark side of digital culture. You can use your Alt key and your mouse. It's int intentional that that slides up a little hard for you to see because information in digital culture is not always easy to find. We've all got our personal dashboards of incoming information. It's different for each one of us. Look at some of the dark issues that we face. I'm going to move over here to this slide, and you can follow my flag. Zoom up above me. Too much information. You ever feel like there's too much information? Think about that. Too much information is as problematic as too little information. Prior to the Gutenberg Press, when people didn't have books, there was very little information. And of course, nobody knew how to read. There were no books. And there was very little access to information. Now we have too much access to information coming at us every single day. And it's equally problematic. The incredible volume of apps and information can be overwhelming. We're simply drowning in it, and we have to learn how to navigate through it. And what about FOMO? F-O-M-O. -O. Anybody know what that is? Type, type it in, in the uh, local chat if you know what FOMO is. Hashtag FOMO. <laughs> Many teens sleep with their cell phones right beside them. Some of you probably do. It's probably always within reach. And many of them have FOMO, which, it, thank you, Sophia. FOMO, fear of missing out. The feeling that something out there is happening and I'm missing it. It's just this feeling that you can't keep up with what's happening because you can't. There's no way to keep up with what's happening. Hey, can you see me? I'm walking over into the weeds. It might be a little harder to see me over here. Information is hard to find in our post-truth world. A world in which each one of us has different information coming at, at us. And why is it all so different? Why is everything divided into believing this and believing that? Well, part of that is because of the slide that's above me now. Look at the, di the Venn diagram above me. This Venn diagram shows confirmation bias. What's confirmation bias? Well, it's that tendency to curate followers and friends on your social media platforms that think like we do. We want our friends to agree with us. And we want our incoming information to agree with us. But that's not the way we learn. We don't learn for, from people who think just like we do. Lev Vygotsky, my favorite child development psychologist, <clears throat> said that we learn through collision with the ideas of others, through debate, respectful debate, not, not arguments you know, filled with emotional, you know, Pro, emotional anger, but through debate. That's how we learn. Through other people's perspectives, through give and take. Confirmation bias, you can't get away from it. It's just, a hum, it's just human nature to want to agree with people, want them to agree with you. Uh, so it's, it's, it's human nature, but we need, to, we need to recognize it within ourselves, that we all have biases like it or not. What about privacy? You ever worry about privacy? Look at the slide over here now, and I hope I don't bump into you with my flag here. <laughs> Look at the slide up there. Is big data mining all of our information? Is Big Brother watching? Big data companies, Google, Facebook, and many others, they are mining our, our data, and sometimes I think Google knows more about me than I know about myself. 
Some people believe privacy is dead. I personally think that happened in 2008, but, <laughs> but it's up to you to think about that. So these are problems. Remember I said there's a dark side of digital culture? I did a presentation re recently on privacy, and I think I worked with Magua on one as well, and on privacy and, and what's the future of privacy? There are a lot of, um, there are a lot of experts working on solutions and on legal solutions to helping young children, ha having laws in place to help protect our privacy. Because a lot of these concerns happened so quickly, we didn't have time to see what was coming. And cybersecurity and privacy experts need to help figure out how to solve some of this. We've got a lot of obstacles to overcome that relate to meta-literacy in digital culture. Privacy, cybersecurity, confirmation bias, all the things I've talked about in this black room. Type of why if you feel there are some concerns, and I've only listed some of them, privacy, cybersecurity, and I'm going to give you um, a time to talk about it in a minute, but I want you to be thinking if you have an example of any worries that you have about the internet and our dependency on it. I went into a store not too long ago to buy something at a drugstore and the clerk said, I'm sorry you can't shop in here today because our internet is down. Talk about a dependency on the internet. I had to just walk back out the door. So we're all standing here together. We're sitting on a beanbag in this cramped dark room and we're real people. We're together as avatars. And I like to say that the avatar, this embodiment as a human is, this embodiment as an av avatar is a meta-literate skill that I think is, is the best way to interact rather than me just speaking to you through a webcam. We'll talk about that too. But look at this light above me. Are we becoming cyborgs? How are we going to keep our humanity in the metaverse? We're in this dark room together. How are we going to get out of the dark side of digital culture? Well, I think the only way we're going to get out of the black room is through understanding digital citizenship. So I thank you all for coming into the black room. And I'm going to invite you to get out of this black room by going upstairs back into the library. And we're going to go upstairs into the reading room to have a close and have a conversation. And here is the Second Life URL. If you stand up, look in the local chat here and click on that slurl, S-L-U-R-L, and that will take you up to the upstairs reading room. I also have a land, landmark I could drop to you. And we're going to meet upstairs. I'll ask you when you're upstairs to have a seat in the upstairs reading room. So everybody, yes, I, oh, you, oh, I did, but I'll, I'll do it again. I was going to drop the landmark too, but I'll just paste it in chat. That, and then I'll meet everybody there. And you can take a seat up in the reading room. All right. You'll find it in your inventory, 
and it is called Think Before You Fo Post. I am me if you did not get one. So think about how you feel about everything we've talked about, meta-literacy and meta-modern culture. And I want you to think about if you have any concerns. Um, and while you're thinking about your own concerns, I, you know, I mentioned the um, Gutenberg parenthesis. For me, that was such a turning point in my life to realize as a librarian that books were no longer important. Think what that must have felt like. I was standing in my school library early one morning, it, and it dawned on me that this place is going away. I felt like the floor was shaking under my feet as I looked around all those books and thought about the years of kids coming in and I'd read to them and tell stories and show them how to find information. If you zoom in on this slide, you can see a picture of the first you know, Bible that Gutenberg printed and books became king and we all learned to read. And for 500 years, that was the way information you know, that was the top. And then it was over. Right during my time as a librarian, that was pretty awesome to be there for that moment. I didn't miss it. And as I was standing there and it was shaking under my feet, I thought, where are we headed? And now I'm standing right here with you in a real library in a virtual world. And I'm standing on the floor and it's not shaking under me, but it's the same. It's exactly the same as I did in the physical world. But it's purposeful. <laughs> it's purposeful that I'm standing on a floor here. This replica is purposeful. So think about that. And I want you to think about the concerns. So I'm going to give you a note card. that will, And you can take it into your inventory, a meta note card. <laughs> and this note card says, meta questions from Valibrarian. So you can use these questions to answer, or you may just have your own uh, concern. I want you to think about concerns that are brought up about you know, what's the future of learning? The future of learning, I think, requires meta literacy. But, you know, there's so many terms. People get uh, hung up on different acronyms and terms. And it's not really so much about the word as it is the importance of the future. So uh, you can get that note card out. There's some meta questions on there. And I'm going to ask you to uh, think about this and then you can type on the note card or on a piece of paper if you're more comfortable with that. And then I'm going to ask you to type in the local chat. And we can use voice, too. Do you have an example of something that really worries you about the Internet and our dependency on all these online tools? Or an example of a concern about digital citizenship? And, uh, and then I have one more thing I wanted to say, too, before you type your concern. What about, as a librarian and as a writing teacher, for years I taught writing, what about citations and um, giving credit where credit is due? I've seen so many posts online and so much online information. No one knows where it came from. That's really important. If we don't credit our sources, it's not about getting a good grade on an assignment. It's about understanding history and understanding who came before us. If we lose that, I had one person say, the internet, it's like a book of sand. The waves just wash it away. So I've talked about all of these ways that you can be responsible digital citizens. And then I talked about all the really bad problems in digital culture. But I personally remain hopeful because I believe that if we choose to be responsible, ethical digital citizens, um, the future, we can figure out the best ways to learn and not get lost in the dark side of digital culture. So you've got your note card. Um, and I'm going to ask John if you want to um, interact with this as well. Feel free to use voice. The three questions I asked was, number one, how has the internet and global networked 
uh, networking changed our culture. And I want you to pick one of these because we're going to open this up for a conversation and address all three. Number two, in what way does this name metamodernism feel like it reflects our philosophical moment in time? Because I don't know if any of you have even heard of metamodernism. So that's another question. And then the third one, as literacy changes, how can you become meta-literate? So um, take your pick. Do you want to type on this note card? Do you want to write down on a piece of paper beside you? Or we're going to use a local chat and address these three questions. Um, also, because I don't want to just do all the talking here when we're in this room together. So I'm going to try to get some of you in, in, involved in this. So be thinking, and I'm going to invite everybody to uh, type in local, in local chat. Let's see who'd like to address one of these questions. And you can take your pick on one, two, or three. While people are thinking about about this, I'm going to share um, one of my current concerns and uh, something that I'm working on at the moment. <clears throat> and that is how democracy will work in this digital metaverse when the metaverse itself is owned by private corporations. And what impact that's going to have on freedom of thought and freedom of action, particularly for universities, but also for all of us. Oh, that is, that is a wonderful question because it brings all these different secu um, private secure, privacy, cybersecurity, all these different dark side of digital you know, uh, culture questions into a current educational problem. And you know, the metaverse, we're in the metaverse right now, and it's quickly evolving. And um, I like to say that it, as an avatar, this embodiment is key to defining the metaverse. But what John just said, another key term to defining the metaverse is interoperability. If you're stuck behind a private company's, you know, um, firewall or you're only interacting in one private company's space and they own the information, what's going to happen to democracy? That is key. The metaverse must be open or, you know, what's going to happen to us all? Uh, that's, that's a huge, huge concern. And we're at a moment where it can, it can be solved if people understand that, pro that problem. And I, I went to a session the other day talking about the metaverse and some were, someone said, and I loved this, I don't want it to be the Zuckerverse. Talking about Zuckerberg and Facebook, um, changing the name of Facebook to Meta and calling it the Metaverse. Zuckerverse? It's like, no way. that they, uh, Zuckerberg cannot own the Metaverse. No, make it stop. So, um, and that's a, an example of what John just said. Private companies cannot own all our information. And so what's going to happen to democracy? And um, I think, you know, there are a lot of smart people out there that understand this problem. And each of you, each avatar sitting here, we need to be aware and understand these issues so that we don't just get lost in it, you know, and, and we become meta-literate and become good digital citizens. So that's a great question. Who else wants to go next and, and think about um, your concerns? Okay, thank you, Sai. Okay. Okay, I don't see the IM. Is it in local chat? It's also John. Um, I could okay. add something here, maybe. Sure. Um, like, we, we, we're talking about democracy, which is an old term by now, but we're talking about democracy in new terms right now. So, because Democracy in metaverse is a little bit different than democracy in living in a country and, you know, you choose your uh, the way of governance and so on. But then um, you, you have a choice here. You don't, you, don't, you don't need to be part of that particular company's metaverse. You could, you could always create your own or you could always join another one or, you know, maybe you don't even use any of those. 
So you you have a you have a kind of a escape route here, rather than just be part of it. But that is, um, you know, that is a deep conversation that we should get into. Uh, absolutely, and Megwa, what you just said, I think that was you, Megwa, right? Um, is uh, that's a personal dashboard? Yeah. You know, when you when you set up your device, what and look at all the different devices. Everyone's on a different kind of device and has different personal dashboards and are in different platforms. So, you know, as you say, that's metamodern because it both connects us all, but it also divides us all. Because if you're all in different platforms in different spaces, you are separated. So that's metamodern. You know, you're, you're, it's two opposites swinging back and forth. And, um, and I see Urjo said, of course, if we compare it to the cultural differences that existed 30 years ago, yes, that's metamodern too, is thinking about where we are now and thinking about what humans were like in the past and not throwing away all the good things from the past but building on them, you know, so it's swimming back to the past as well as developing the future. Um, because there was a lot accomplished throughout thousands of years of history that was great, that we don't want to just dissolve and slip away and we're all in our own little unique digital world, you know. Um, so history will just repeat itself again and again. So, um, you know, all of these problems relate so much to the metaverse. What is the metaverse? It is coming, like it or not. We're in it right now. You know? And it's like we better figure out how to develop it right and, and do it with, um, with backup plans for archival and with the best practices for being good digital citizens that are meta-literate. Okay, so another question? Yes, it includes the past as well as the new. Um, and think of those two terms because I want to I want to see if you like the terms. Do you think we need the terms? Do you think we need to know what metamodernism is? Do you think we need to address the fact that life has changed and literacy has changed? And do you think it's helpful to use the terms? I'm looking in the chat to see who's who's asked. Who's answered the question? Sidon, thanks for repeating the questions. Each, pick one to see who, who wants to go next. Don't be shy. Feel free to use your voice as well. You don't have to type. And you can address a worry to a concern, because there are lots of worries and concerns. You don't have to give the answer. <laughs> I think another key word that we might bring up is empathy. Everybody's very quiet today, Val. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot to you take in. You shocked them, exactly. Um. I was just thinking about like the culture and everything that maybe like avatar appearances and stuff and like default appearances could definitely fall into how culture is appreciated in the metaverse, <laughs> you know, online. I'm glad you brought up avatar appearance appearances. Great, because, you know, the way that you represent yourself online is the is you you know and we need we need to think about how we represent ourselves and we're how authentic we are to build trust in another class um, we have been experimenting last year with more realistic avatars that use photographs to build the avatar presentation. 
because I know many academics find the animated style of a lot of virtual worlds to be infantilizing. And so there's an interest in trying to develop more realistic looking avatars and particularly avatars that can reflect what we look like in the real world. A very interesting question, Sophia. Yes, and as the metaverse develops um, across other platforms, we may be able to uh, hypergrid jump our avatar from place to place with interoperability. There is a site, Ready Player Me, where you can you can do that to some um, virtual environments, uh, and all of this will probably evolve. Um, I know uh, I have avatars in many different worlds. Um, I think Second Life is probably to date the best platform I've been in of all the ones I've explored due to all the many tools that are here. But there are many virtual environments out there. All right, I see the developments that have emerged in this sense have caused the societies in which these technologies have entered their lives to experience many changes from their economies to their entertainment, from their cultures to their education, from their communications to scientific research, from their laws to their political bureaucratic structures. That's so true. All those different things have been impacted by well, I call it digital culture, but this complete global networking where everything is connected and it, it really has changed uh, life, you know, and it's um, and it, in both good and in both good ways as well as challenging ways. So that's what you can bring up. It, go ahead and bring up a good way that it's changed, but also the bad ways that it's changed are worries. You know, I have a lot of concerns for the next generation of learner. How are they going to dig deep into critical thinking when we can just, you know, cruise the top, just, you know, go along the top of it? The Shallows is one of the best books I read. We just skim the top and go to the next fun app. Are they going to dig deep into critical thinking? I feel like it's also very apparent in the whole, you know, political situation in Ukraine and things, how global networking has affected even just like a war in ways that before it kind of, kind of hadn't. Like even with people saying that like propaganda almost isn't working in Russia because of social networking and things of how you can get messages across without such, like, I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense. <laughs> Yes, it does. It does. And it's different because there's always been propaganda, but it hasn't been instant, you know, live, instant, everywhere like it is now. You had time to reflect and analyze that it was propaganda. <laughs> Having no time to reflect. I think is one of the biggest problems because our brains need time to reflect and, and, and really understand something, critical thinking, but you're always on to the next, to the next uh, meme and the next you know, thing, scrolling through your social media, the next picture. Yes, and Wisdom Seeker says you're getting these images live while it's actually happening. That's, that's really um, hard to keep up with. Okay, and I see um, from Yuso, a digitally literate 
individual has a variety of digital skills. Basic principles of smart devices and social networks, interaction with communities and social media, accessing information, analyzing it, skills like critical thinking are some of them. Having these skills strengthens the digital experience of the individual on different media platforms. This skill will evolve with the evolution of digital media. Really well put, and sometimes it's hard for those skills to evolve without the time to reflect and think about it because we're so busy jumping on to the next thing. Um, that's a meta modern, uh, that's what Mag was putting out. This whole retro movement, lots of old pictures and videos used like they're, used like they're new on social media. It's this tip of the hat jumping back to the past and saying, oh, look, and sometimes in funny ways sometimes, in really intriguing ways sometimes, looking at history through new eyes. That's meta modern. It's bringing up the past in a new way. Yes, scrolling from a beautiful image of little kittens to images of war. Quick, quick, snap your fingers. You're going from the next to the next to the next. What's, what is that doing to the human brain? Our brains don't work that way. That's my biggest concern. That's why I'm standing here in front of you today. It's for my grandson. I'm very worried about the future of young children. And I taught them for 30 years. You know, it's like... Kids were, they lived in a different world. They had time to think about the story I just told them instead of looking at 15 different pictures at the same time. Yes, and I, and I currently have never let my grandson, who's five, try on my VR headset. He's just, they're not ready. They don't know what it does to the human brain. Keep thinking of those questions, and if you have any other worries that you feel like. So, Sophia says, I feel like there should be age ratings. Well, there are. People just don't follow them. <laughs> but if you go to Common Sense Media, like I wanted to know for my grandson if a certain app would be appropriate for him. I, I went to Common Sense Media. It will tell you. Um, his mom really wants to limit his screen time. Um, but you know it's so innate. I when I upgraded my phone, I couldn't figure out one thing on it, and my five-year-old grandson showed me how to scroll up and do that. It's innate for the young people to because the devices are built for that for our touch screens, and he could figure it out so easy. But we have to think about balancing that screen time with the physical world. A lot of high-tech people who work for the social companies don't let their kids have digital devices. I find that really interesting. <laughs> I was reading that years ago in research. Silicon Valley is a big hub, you know, for internet, um, for different applications. And they don't, the children there don't even have them in their school because they, they realized they were putting into the hands of young children these devices that were impacting their brains and we had no idea what was happening to them. It happened before anybody thought about that. Absolutely, they send their children to Montessori schools so they can learn how to pour water and fold napkins and, and, and touch things and have time to think. <laughs> you know, there's not, a, and you know the word boredom. I don't. Th I think it's out of the. If well, there's no dictionary. If there was a dictionary, that word wouldn't be in it, because if you're bored, just pick up your phone. There's no such thing. But being bored gave a child years ago time to think, to be imaginative, and use a stick to play with and turn it into something, <laughs> and rocks. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes, I when I my school actually uh, went through this stage where they got iPads for all the children, and they told me as the librarian, I don't want to see you reading to kids. Teach them how to use the apps, and I felt like I was robbing them of their imaginations. It was shortly before I retired, and I, I hope that they've swung away from that horrendous mistake they were making. And then the pandemic hit, and they had to use the devices. So, you know, it's like, we, that's what I mean by balance. We have to figure out a way to balance our, our physical and virtual lives. And so Yusil says, an age in which speculative thinking styles are increasingly developing with the extremist political fractions that have risen with the authority they receive from internet culture. That's a great sentence. However, metamodernism itself was not conceived as a philosophy or art movement, as it did not describe and define a closed system of thought or dictate a particular set of aesthetic values and methods. Okay, maybe you can elaborate on that, because it's... We don't know how things are rapidly changing. We don't really know for sure how quickly this time period will be because each time period before was much longer. Things are rapidly changing. So, you know, time will tell what, how these things are going to go in the future. No one can truly predict. And I think what you're saying there, because it does relate, you know, our philosophical moment is always reflected through our art and music and literature because it's coming from the human being exp expressing oneself. So it, it, that's, but that's not the definition of the philosophical moment. It's just an expression of what it feels like through human experiences. And for me, personally, one thing that made me realize life was changing was when I first heard Radiohead. Radiohead it was definitely a, a, the sound of postmodernism and maybe moving into metamodernism. Yeah. And it's like, and I love Radiohead. But so music sometimes does reflect the philosophical feeling of an era. As I look out here on all of you, you, you seem very comfortable in the virtual world. And um, so either John or Magro with having students in the virtual world, I, I'm very interested in how you feel about this talk in this environment, because you can mention that in chat too. You're in this environment. I'm, I feel just like I would if I were standing in a real library with you, because I've been here long enough to feel comfortable with it. And I wonder if you feel that comfortable. And I could have done this presentation, of course, on something like Zoom, and you would see my, my face, and I could just show you the slides, and I could lecture in that way. But I feel like being in here with you, I, I prefer it. It takes the emphasis off peeking through someone's window you know, into us being in a shared space and I feel like that is going to change things in the future. I feel like the metaverse, the key word is embodiment. Okay, if you're a bit new, it still feels more like a game to me than a reflection of real life. I love it, love it, love it. You know, I came into Second Life as a librarian. And I'm not a gamer. I don't really want anything chasing me. Although with a VR headset, I went to many demos to see if VR could be used for education. And mostly I had to slay zombies because most VR is games. 
And it was like, oh, well, you know, I, I, I don't mind zombies. You know, I did watch a lot of The Walking Dead. It's pretty good. But, but it's like, I don't want something chasing me. So I'm not a gamer. I'm here as a librarian. So it's interesting to get people's perception on it feeling like a game. I, I've never really even played a game here. I think that was a good, really good point to talk about metal literacy because it's it's like digital culture can be whatever anyone wants, and that sounds like a good thing. It's not really because it puts all the responsibility on you whether you want to play a game all day or you want to really focus and 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 uh, think about important concepts and critical thinking, and we're putting that responsibility on five year olds. You know, and it's like that's really difficult. Do you want to play a game or do you want to read War and Peace? Well, War, I read War and Peace when, when I read the book The Shallows and it said the internet is changing your brain and no one is going to read War and Peace ever again because the human brain will be incapable of linear focus for that long. So I had to read it before it was too late. <laughs> Can I ask um, you guys, students, how you think the talk today might impact on your team project and the content of that? Anybody got any ideas? Maybe it's something for you to think about over the next week or two. Use the material that you've been introduced to today and indeed last week at uh, Virtual Ability Island to broaden the scope of your projects and to inform your responses to the brief. Will we wrap up, do you think, Val? You've been on your feet a long time. Your yes. must be getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we can wrap up here, and I want to thank you all for coming to the Community Virtual Library. Um, and we have uh, so many more things here that I can tell you about, but I just am really happy that you all were able to come and talk about these important changes in culture. Meta literacy is, I think, extremely important. And uh, good luck on your coursework. And feel free to offer friendship and return here at, at any time. And I, uh, I thank you all for the opportunity to, to um, come here to the Community Virtual Library. Thank you, Val. Um, and on behalf of everybody, um, thank you very much for your presentation today your generosity in sharing your thinking and your ideas and giving us a little tour of the facilities um, and the broad scope of, of what's available here in the community virtual library um, it's always a really interesting visit um, and the perspective you bring to bear is so important in terms of creating awareness about some of the things that we might just take for granted um, if you don't point them out to us. So thank you very much indeed. Magua, I'm going to hand over to you to do the final wrap up, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, thank you, Well, uh, That was a really uh, nice presentation as usual. And then um, I think we have been introduced to uh, many new terms here like the meta modernism and the meta literacy uh, so i think we have a lot a lot of things to think about after this presentation and um, i enc encouraged our students uh, to think about this a little bit deeper and please try to 
uh, complete their assignments on blog pages uh, for this week's work. Mm-hmm.